Would you bow your heads and your hearts with me together this day? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the party. <laughs> Thou art the potter, and we are the clay. I, uh, I, you know, had a note here that says, you know, birthday party <laughs> yesterday, and I saw that, and I said, Thou art the party. Oh, God is the party, isn't he? When you think about it, God is the party. I like the way Megan said it, you know. He's the author and perfecter of our life because we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. We run with perseverance that race because at the finish line, there's going to be a celebration. And uh, we can look forward to that. We are uh, a nation now that has entered our 240th year. It may have had, there may have been a party last night. I know there was a party out in the back parking lot, it looked like. <laughs> Uh, Jeff was out there sweeping up the debris from all the fireworks that the neighbors shot off in our parking lot this morning. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it probably uh, affected people uh, in that, you know, people stayed up late to watch the fireworks and families with children said, hey, you know, uh, we want to celebrate that day. Grand celebration, a few hours that bring us together as a people Hot dogs, cold beverages, sparklers, flags, bunting, and great fireworks. You know, that's the 4th of July. One of my favorite social commentators over the years was the late Irma Bombeck. I think she said it so well so many times. You have to love a nation that celebrates the independence, its independence every 4th of July, not with parades of guns and tanks and missiles and soldiers all marching in front of the White House but with family picnics, where kids throw frisbees, where potato salad gets soggy and where the flies die from happiness. <laughs> That's so true, you know, the great 4th of July is most earnestly, I think, thought of together as a, as a picnic for the nation. In uh, May of, May 17th of 2013, the Peoria Journal Star had this um, story. It said the country's melting pot of cultures just got a little richer today. 86 immigrants from 33 countries were sworn in as naturalized U.S. citizens at the federal courthouse in Peoria. Uh, Judge James Shadid oversaw this nationalization ceremony. He says in spite of all the talk about increasing immigration limitations on a nationwide basis, he considered the citizens who took the oath today as the gold standard of U.S. citizenship. Here's a group of inspiring men and women who've done it the right way. They've played by the rules, and today they become citizens. I don't think we can say enough about them. One of those new citizens was a woman named Maria Rosa Gro. Maria was originally from Spain. She was a citizen of Spain. She became a United States citizen after living in this country for nearly 50 years. Uh, she said, now I'm going to be able to vote, and that's what I really want to do, to be able to vote. A longtime resident of Peoria, she said, I like to be involved in my community, and now I really can feel that I am a part of and giving something to my community by my citizenship. Reading that article, reminded me of the old Coca-Cola jingle, you know, that was so popular uh, maybe uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. These 86 individuals who became citizens that, that May in 2013 waited for at least five years. Some of them waited for many years beyond that. They learned the language of the country they learned about our nation's laws. They passed a constitution test that said they knew what our constitution said and what it meant. And they also were screened and they passed a security check that they weren't any threat to the nation, but indeed they would bring something wonderful to the nation, a new individual perspective through the eyes of a citizen who, who wants so desperately to be here and be a part of the life of our country. Behind them were several hundred proud relatives with cameras, of course, all waving American flags. The Army Color Guard came in and marched in and posted the colors. 
And then a soloist stood up and sang both the national anthem and God Bless America. And the speaker himself that day was a naturalized citizen, the vice president of a bank. And his presence there spoke volumes about the American dream that is still alive, the American dream, to be a citizen of this country made up of immigrants. Finally, the new citizens took their vows, but before they could take their vows as citizens of our country, the first thing they had to do was denounce their citizenship in any other country. Think of that. You have to denounce your citizenship in any other country. And once they had done that, they all joined together and they said, I believe uh, in this country. And they said, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Uh, it was a glorious day, I'm sure. As Christians, you and I, we have a dual citizenship, don't we? When you stop and think about it. We're citizens of this country, or I guess as Christians in other places around the world, we would be citizens of whatever country we were in, or a part of there. But simultaneously, as Christians, we are also members or citizens of the kingdom of God. We are citizen Christians, or maybe we're Christian citizens. I don't know which is which. But we don't have to denounce our loyalty to God to be a member of uh, the citizenry of the United States of America. And likewise, we don't have to denounce our citizenship in this country to be a member of the kingdom of God. We have a dual citizenship. And we live out our Christian faith and our citizenship and those two covenants together uh, day to day. Jesus himself mandated that arrangement. He was at a tension-filled place in his life. It was the last week of his earthly life. There he was, and he was then surrounded by the scribes and the Pharisees and the Herodians and the people who came, and they were trying desperately to trip him up in some way, to get him to speak some, some statement that would cause him to trip in the eyes of the people, and then they would have charges that could be brought against him, real charges, they thought. And so they devised a tough question. They said, ah, Jesus, should we be paying these taxes to Rome that are required of us? Brian Booknight, who's a pastor out in Pennsylvania, said, if Jesus says no, don't pay your taxes, then Death was assured. The Romans would haul him off right away and say, he's an insurrectionist. He's saying, don't pay your taxes. Don't, you know, don't honor the, the, uh, the kingdom of Rome. Don't honor the emperor. And he'd be put to death right away. They were um, all over Palestine, and they stamped out revolutionaries like snakes, says Book Knight. On the other hand, if Jesus advised people, go ahead, pay your taxes, be good, loyal citizens to the empire of Rome, then he knew that he would be risking alienating all those Jewish authorities that were there, breathing down his neck. That's what they wanted. They resented so much the pagan interlopers who were occupying their country. They hated the Romans. They felt like they were conquered and oppressed, and indeed they were. Jesus wisely turns the question back on them and says, well, let me ask you the question. Whose picture and whose inscription, whose name is on the coin with which you pay your taxes? See, in order to pay your taxes, you had to use Roman coinage. And in order to do that, you had to trade in your, your Jewish or your Hebrew money and exchange it for Roman money. And so somebody surely had a Roman coin in their bag or their purse or their pocket or whatever. And when that person got their coin out and gave it to Jesus, it was clear that the emperor's picture was stamped on the coin and the name of Julius Caesar or whoever it was, whichever Caesar it was, was stamped on the coin. Now, that in and of itself, when you stop and think about it, if this is a group of Orthodox Jews, and yet they have in their possession this coinage, that is of the emperor, and remember, the Romans say that the emperor is equal to God, then that person was already breaking the Ten Commandments, that thou shalt have no graven, make no graven images 
of any gods. Jesus says, you have to decide for yourself, friends. Render unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar, but render unto God that which belongs to God. In effect, Jesus is acknowledging that both God and the state have legitimate claims upon our lives. And that's true today as it is. More than ever it's true today. We Christians must decide how we live out our two covenants that sometimes come into conflict with each other. Paul clearly told the Romans that they should be subject to the governmental authorities because the governmental authorities were established for order and rule of the nations by God's providence. In other words, God's blessing was upon them. Now, I know and you know, as we look at politicians today, uh, we look at our nation, we look at all these people running for president and stuff like that, and we say, my goodness, it strains our imagination that those people can have some kind of religious or spiritual authority over us as we elect them to this position. We're not fond of having to pay extra taxes about things, are we? We still have some of the same issues that the Romans had, or that the, uh, that the Palestinians had, that the Jewish people had at the times of the Roman Empire. But Paul tells us clearly, there's an obligation that we owe the state as citizens of the state. The authors of our Constitution certainly did not plan for the United States of America to be a quote-unquote entirely secular nation. Entirely secular without any recognition of the presence of the divine authority of God. Honestly, I don't think they even used the word secular back then. I kind of tried to do a little word search and study, and it seems to me that secular in the way we use it today uh, probably didn't come into common parlance until the middle or late 1800s. Uh, but it's uh, the other side of the balance of the secular or the sacred. In the Gallup poll, the most recent one that I could find from 2014, it said that four-fifths, 80% of the majority of people who live in the United States of America say that they believe in God, 80%. Perhaps um, uh, there are 16% that say, no, I don't believe in God, and there's another 4% that said, well, we don't exactly know, and they didn't really answer the question. 43% of those who said, I believe in God, also said that they were regular attenders, regular attenders at worship services, organized worship services. Now, it didn't ask if it was a church or if it was a synagogue or if it was a mosque or if it was some other entity. But people said, I regularly go and practice my religion uh, on a basis that, con that cons I consider myself to be an active part of some organized religious experience, typically on a weekly or at least regular basis. We are a nation of largely religious people, aren't we? We are a nation. Now we're diverse, we're diverse. In America, one of our principles that we hold to as fast and dear is that we provide opportunities for people of other faiths to practice their religion, because we don't respect any one religion over another. We also believe that children in public schools should not be indoctrinated by any one particular religion. Think about that. Should not be indoctrinated by any one particular religion. I think that's a good rule and a good law. Not too many years ago out in Blackwood, New Jersey, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the senior class could not have a sectarian prayer at their graduation ceremony. Uh, this was the prayer that they were going to use. Please bless us in the future, and thank you for the blessings of the past. God, keep a watchful eye over us in the future. Now that's a pretty innocuous prayer, really. Uh, there's not a whole lot there. But because they said, God, watch over us in the future, uh, the judges decided they shouldn't use that prayer. I don't know how it went. I didn't hear. It's kind of died down since then. There was another high school commencement not too far from our area here where the student class president stood up 
to give his speech. And as he stood up to give his speech, he paused for a moment. He bowed his head and he began and he said, Our Father, which art in heaven. And as he did that, <laughs> the entire assembly of people, it seemed, chorused together and they all shared praying the Lord's Prayer. Uh, that probably would happen here in Pekin, wouldn't it? If someone were to start the prayer like that uh, in a secular situation and people would join together and pray the prayer. Oh, maybe not everybody moved their lips or said the prayer, but the prayer would certainly uh, be prayed. And the principal of one high school did get the last word in a situation where at the conclusion of the commencement speech, he stood up and he said, God bless you and God bless the United States of America. And immediately all the students jumped to their feet and applauded that principal. Uh, why is it so important that we pause and acknowledge the presence of God in the life of our country? It's not because God needs our ego boost. God doesn't need us uh, to build him up, does he? It's because I believe that God is the source of our liberty and our true freedom as a nation. God is the source of the moral knowledge between right and wrong upon which our laws and rules uh, rest. Thomas Jefferson was the father of this concept of the separation of the church and the state, that we need to keep them you know, separate. And yet he was very clear that God is an essential part of the nation. And along with the preamble to the Constitution, one of the things that Jefferson wrote and said is, our liberties are a gift from God. Our liberties are a gift from God. I know in today's media we have lots of conversation about things that are sensational and exciting. Much of what we hear is bad news and that tends to create uh, bad conversations it seems like. I'm convinced that America is greater and better and stronger than all those media reports that kind of want to fan the flames of negativity or you know, separation or division among us. We hear all these things particularly about the uh, Confederate flag right now and how that has so divided people. I wish we could begin to focus on the positive news. Hey, I've got some positive news. Do you know that Christian teenagers from our own church spent a week recently working and providing a week of ministry to the uh, youth and the children of the Pekin Housing Authority? And in just a couple of weeks, there are going to be a group of 30 people from this church, mostly young people, but some adult counselors who are going to get together and get into a couple of vans, and they're going to go down to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and they're going to work for an entire week in an urban mission, doing a variety of things like providing a Bible school for young children and probably working on some homes that need to be repaired or updated or insulated or brought up to code uh, for people that can't afford to do so. That's good news. That's good news. More good news. Several years ago, the Southern Baptist Convention, largely a church from the southern part of this nation, repented officially and officially apologized to all African American citizens of the United States for perpetrating racism over the years. I salute our Baptist brothers and sisters. Uh, Many non-Baptists also join with that act of repentance of saying, hey, there are things we've done that are wrong over the years as a nation, and we need to be sorry for that. Thanks to our leadership, the doors of reconciliation between the races can be more open. We need that, don't we? That would be good news. Our own annual conference that met recently over in Peoria, uh, we took considerable time sharing an act of repentance and healing uh, to indigenous people and American Native, Native Americans. Uh, because we say there were things that happened that even happened because of the agency of our own church years ago that affected and brutalized and victimized Native American people. And the church ought to be in the forefront of saying that was wrong and we're sorry. The next time somebody asks you, you know any good news? Tell them about your church. Tell them about the church of our country and how we're trying to open doors of reconciliation. As far as it is possible to you, Paul writes, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with all people. Couldn't all of us resolve to lower our voices a little bit 
in this national debate over uh, marriage, in this national debate over the Confederate flag? Couldn't we learn to control our passions a bit? Couldn't we learn to be a little less disagreeable without disagreeing on everything, but we could agree to, to say that we hold several opinions about things and respect other people? Let us learn how to be able to disagree without being disagreeable, is what I'm trying to say. Let us be peacemaker citizens in our country. Peace that brings a level-headedness to our thinking in stressful times. Peace that models the way we respect and care for other people who may have different opinions, different ideas, and different beliefs than ours. And peace that models a sense of moral character that is influenced by the teachings and the life of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you remember the name of Scott O'Grady. In 1995, he uh, was the pilot that went down in Bosnia, and for six days and six nights, he was there, you know, on the ground. Uh, one of the things that happened when he came back and was rescued by 51 Marines who came in and finally were able to extract him safely was that when he did his reports, he kept saying how much God was with him, and that kind of embarrassed the media a little bit, I guess, but it was a great witness when he said, you know, I was there and I was hiding out because the enemies were all around me and I prayed that God would make it rain and it was a storm that came and saved me and protected me. And then he said, I prayed, I prayed on my you know, day that I was there. I said, I just pray that somebody knows I'm here. And he says, later that night, he got a radio transmission that was very brief and it was the voice of one person that he recognized from a ship that said, hunker down, stay put, we're coming to get you. And that night he was extracted and brought home to the United States of America. Captain O'Grady uh, was grateful uh, for that good news that there were people who stood with him and behind him and for him. Today I invite you to the table of the Lord and to the good news that God still is with us. God hasn't forgotten us or forsaken us. And that you and I as citizen Christians can make a positive difference in this world because of the grace of Jesus Christ in us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.